Okay, so the first uh, video of the semester is going to be to create a product render. Here is the result that we're going for. And here is one of the references, and here is another one of the references. I just did a, um, a Google search for mug uh, or coffee mug. Um, I may have done a Creative Commons search. I may not have. I don't remember. Um, but they're just references. Uh, and that's what we're going for. So it's it's relatively simple, um, but I think it's going to be good practice to to work on getting clean, uh, finished feeling renders. Uh, so we've got a new scene, and the first thing that we want to do is practice good file management, which I know is super exciting, but very important. So go to File and Project Window. Okay, we're going to create a new project for this. So you click New and name it. We'll call it. Um, coffee mug. Um, yeah, that'll be good. And choose your save destination. So for me, I'm going to go up a level or two. Advanced 3D 2018. And this looks like a good spot. Hit select and accept. Okay, so now we've created that project. And as a reminder, let's take a quick look at this, the project hierarchy or the project structure that we just created. So, okay, so here it is. Here's a project we just created, and Maya automatically creates all of these subfolders. Uh, we won't be using most of these subfolders, but there's a couple of important ones. We have source images. Um, which is where we will want to put the cement texture that we're going to use eventually. Um, source images is the default folder that Maya looks at um, anytime you say, you know, uh, open a file texture um, or an image plane. That's the default. And then for renders, it will automatically save to the images folder. Okay, now that we're not using RenderMan, we're not going to have a separate RenderMan folder that you have to deal with. It'll be in the images folder. Uh, and then your scenes will be in the scene folder. Uh, again, the, the advantage of, of working in these constraints and this, this structure is that when you need to, um, for instance, submit a project for grading, you just zip up the whole project folder, send that to me, and then I get all of your textures, all of your um, renders, everything contained. You don't have to worry about missing links. Um, the fonts would be the exception, so if you do have custom fonts, um, you know, send those along too. But uh, it keeps things nice and tidy. So we've got the project created. We also need to save this um, Maya project. Uh, so we'll call this Coffee Mug Zero One and uh, White, because this is going to be the whoops. This is going to be the White Mug. And then if we have some time later, we'll do the two-tone mug at the end. So uh, click Save. And we can look back at our project and go to Scene Folder. And there it is. Here's the Maya file we just saved. OK, so now we're all set up and ready to work. OK, so now that we uh, have our scene set, uh, let's start modeling. And I'm going to first create a simple ground plane. Uh, so I'm just going to go to the poly modeling shelf, click on plane. And then first thing I'm going to do is name it. I'm just going to name it ground. You could also name it floor or anything that makes sense to you. Just name it something, please. And then in the inputs here of the channel box layer editor, I'm going to set uh, my width and height to 30, and that's it. I've made a ground. Now, <laughs> let's make a mug. So, uh, for a mug, I think it's perhaps no surprise that you know, we're going to start with a cylinder. So, again, poly modeling, a shelf, uh, click on the cylinder, or you can go up to create polygon primitives and cylinder. Once you do that, name it. 
I'm going to name it mug. Actually, coffee mug. Not that there's going to be multiple mugs, but uh, it's descriptive. And then under uh, inputs, there's a couple things that we want to do here. Um, the first thing is the subdivisions on the axis. Uh, we usually don't need 20, but I'm, uh, I'm going to bring it down to 16. And the reason I'm choosing 16, normally for something round like this I'd go 8, or if I was going to have the camera close up to it in this instance, 12 would probably be fine. But I'm going to go with 16 because we're going to need to eventually extrude out this handle from the side of the mug, because this is all one piece. And with 16, this is, gives me a decent width to extrude out from. Um, there'll still be a, a couple of adjustments to make, but it's going to set, set us up um, for that future uh, extrusion quite nicely. I'm also going to, under Translate Y, uh, move it up one unit so that it's sitting on the floor. And uh, going back down to the inputs, subdivision caps. If we look at the top here, I'm going to set that to 2. Oops, not 0, 2. Okay, and that's going to give us a really nice um, edge loop and face loop on both sides so that uh, I can make those extrusions a little bit easier, not have to add that myself. Uh, and I think that's just about it for... Well, okay, so the radius is going to be the last thing. Is going to be uh, just establishing this general size and form. So for the radius, you can see it's just a little bit wider than it is tall. And I've got the quad view up here. I just tap spacebar right, to jump into quad view. If that doesn't come up, then you can just hit the quad view here on the, on the left side. You've got your, your presets, your layout presets. Um, and so I'm going to keep an eye on the, on the front view as I do this. i go back to my inputs and radius. With radius selected, I can middle click and drag. And that will adjust the radius accordingly. So, uh, and you can hold down control if you want finer tune adjustments. And so, I don't know, something like that. When I did this the first time, I didn't, I wasn't too specific about, you know, 1.43 or whatever. It was just kind of by eye getting a feel for what I wanted to look like, and then I made adjustments as I went. So we'll start here. Uh, I'm at 1.56. If you're somewhere in that ballpark, you should be just fine. Okay, so that's the, the general shape of the mug. Uh, I'm going to jump into uh, perspective here and realize I probably didn't need to make this ground plane because it's going to make this next bit slightly tricky. So uh, I'm going to, with the ground plane selected, I'm going to click in, in the channel box layer editor. Uh, let's see, this button right here, this last button, the square in the, in the circle, it's going to create a new layer and assign the selected object to that layer. And I'll just call this ground. Uh, let's see, we'll call it layer underscore ground. Click save and then turn off the visibility so we can just focus on the mug. Okay. So I'm going to work in probably quad view for a bit because I want to be able to see the, the orthographic while I work in perspective. Um, and what I want to focus on right now is this lower profile. And if I go back to the original source image and not my render, you can see that there's a little bit of a kind of a foot down here almost. And that's that's what I want to keep in mind as I'm making this bottom curve. So I'm going to go into edge mode. So right click, edge, double click on that bottom edge. Okay, you can see I just have that edge selected. And I'm going to move it up to about here. 
Okay, so right here what I'm doing is I'm defining how long this the, the perfectly vertical part of this mug is. All right, and that's about what looks to be probably 75 to 80 percent of, of the height of the mug is perfectly straight. So that's kind of what I'm replicating here. Now you'll notice that that part of the bottom is still on the floor and that's because we have that extra subdivision when we made the cylinder. Okay, uh, so that is, that's defined the vertical part of the mug. Now we need to get that that curve in there and we also need to get that little kind of foot here on the on the bottom. So let's worry about that foot first and we need to select all of these faces and actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into vertex mode and just click and drag across those bottom vertices and it's going to select all of them. It's faster than selecting 16 individual faces. Um, so I'm going to select all of them and I'm going to move them up just a little bit. Okay. Just slightly off the ground because what I'm going to do now is I'm going to extrude back down. All right. Uh, now something I, I don't remember if I showed last semester or not is how to change your selections. So if you hold down command and right click, you've got um, some selection options. So we can go two faces and two contained faces and that's going to select all of those bottom faces. I'll show that again. Okay, so we have all of these vertices at the bottom selected, which I just did a click and drag across whoops, in, in vertex mode click and drag across and you select all those all those vertices. All right, make sure that's that's all you have selected, you don't have anything else selected. The uh, the 3D manipulator, the the widget here should be at the center vertex. Once you have that, if you hold down the command button and hold down the right mouse button, you're going to bring up this menu which is going to be all of your uh, kind of selection options. So you've got gross selection, uh, shrink selection, and then you can also convert your selection to edges or to faces. And what we want is to go to faces, and then we want to go to contained faces. So contained faces is all of the faces that these vertices are kind of outlining. Um, if we just did two faces, then it would select all the faces that the vertices are touching. And if we did uh, to face perimeter, uh, it appears to just select those. So I actually never use face perimeter. I usually either just do two faces or two, two uh, contained faces. So it's a as you get used to that workflow and you know the the right clicking, it's faster than manually selecting 16 faces. Um, okay, so I have all those selected. Now what I want to do is extrude those down back down to the ground. So I'm going to turn on grid snapping which is this first magnet icon up here with the grid. All right, when that's on, you'll see the center of this manipulator turns to a circle. That tells you that you have some form of snapping on. And um, remember, this is a new new functionality with Maya 2017 or 2018. I don't remember when it, 18? Um, I don't, yeah. So if you hold down shift and hover over the manipulator, you can see that it says extrude. So instead of having to shift right click and go to extrude faces or get to extrude any other way, um, this is a very quick way to, to extrude some faces. So hold down shift, you'll see extrude. Just click on the vertical, okay? It should be uh, green. It might be yellow if you've already selected it, but um, normally it'll be green. And then click and drag. And with grid snapping on, it's gonna snap right down to the ground. Um, Nice and perfect. Okay, so we've got that extruded. I'm going to turn off grid snapping because uh, I don't want that on for now. And I'm just going to jump into quad view. And I think I want to scale this down just a little bit. Uh, but I'll hold off on that. We can make that adjustment once we get a, a better sense of the, the curve of this. So. To add this kind of subtle curve into the bottom of the mug, we need to add an edge loop. So we're going to go into edge mode, 
and shift right click, oops, select an edge, shift right click, and insert edge loop tool. Click on the box next to that to bring up your options. Uh, and just make sure that you have uh, equal distance from edge. Relative would also work in this case because it is perfectly symmetrical. Um, you just don't want multiple edge loops. Just, just want one edge loop right now. Okay, and then I'm going to add it right about here. So pretty close to the top. Then I'm going to click W to bring up my move tool. Double click on that new edge and bring it down a little bit. Okay, you can see now we're starting to define that curve. Okay, so we've got that, and right about now is when I'm going to start occasionally hitting three on the number pad to check how this looks when it's smoothed. And you can see, when I smooth this out, it loses all sorts of shapes. It gets very mushy. Uh, so we're going to need to add a couple of edge loops to control this and, and make, make sure that we're retaining the form. Um, it doesn't quite feel right yet. I'm going to select both of these edges, and I'm going to move them down. That feels better. Yeah, that, that feels better. Okay. Um, and here's what it looks like in, in quad view. In case you're wondering, um, so now let's add a couple of, of control loops here to make sure that this stays uh, tight. So uh, I'm in edge mode. So shift right click, insert edge loop tool. I'm going to add an edge right here, and. I'm going to add another edge up here. So this edge is going to stop the when it smooth, smooths, it's going to stop it from traveling up the mug. It's going to hold it right there. Uh, and then this edge is going to keep that transition tight. I'm going to add one more. Uh, I'm going to select all these faces. I'm going to extrude this in just a little bit. So I'm going to select them all, shift right click, extrude the face, and then I just want to adjust the offset. I don't want to adjust the thickness. So I'm going to hold down control to give it finer tune control and just a little bit. And again, that's just going to keep that corner sharp. So now when I hit three on the number pad, you can see that that keeps it uh, holding its shape a little bit better. Um, I'm going to bring this edge in a little bit, so I'm going to select it and just scale it in. And it's a little high, so I'll move it down just a smidge. So something like that. Okay, hit three on the number pad again. Um, you'll notice that I am I am checking the smoothed view, but I am not modeling in the smoothed view. Uh, because this view lies to you. All right. In the when you hit no, hit one and set the display smoothness to to one, you just see you see the actual geometry that's there. All right. If you hit three, that's not where the like this vertex is not actually here in space. It's actually here. Okay. You can see that difference. If you hit two, you can kind of see the comparison. So. You don't want to be be just worrying about this because this is not where your geometry is, and that can get you in trouble. Also, it seems as though I had a face selected uh, when I did uh, that last extrusion. So I'm going to fix that real quick. I wasn't paying attention to what I had selected, so I'm just going to select all of those, delete them, double click on that edge, shift right click and fill the hole. And now we're fine. OK. So I've got the bottom of this more or less sorted. Now it's time to deal with the top of this. 
So I'm going to select this edge and I'm going to scale it up leaving about the thickness of the mug that I want which is about eh, that looks about good and now I'm going to do a command right click again and I'm going to change my selection to faces to contain faces Oops. and it doesn't work awesome Contained faces? No. Okay, so instead, let's just select the center vertex and command right click and two faces, and that'll select all of them. All right, with those selected, we can uh, do a couple of extrusions. So uh, I'm just going to extrude this all the way down. I'm going to go as far as, when we see this black line, that means it's intersecting with the outside of the mug. So I'm going to pull it up just past that. Uh, a little bit more. Okay. And then I'm going to hold down shift. I'm going to do, I'm going to extrude it one more time. And that's just going to give me a second edge loop to keep that tight and, and keep the inside of the mug from smoothing out towards the top of it. All right. And that's all I'm going to do for the inside kind of bottom of the mug because we're never going to see that. This is the most that we're going to see of the mug, okay? See, even even on the initial reference, you, you see maybe a third of the way into the mug. Not that much. So, I've got that. Um, and... I'm going to add a couple more edge loops now. So if I hit three on the number pad and smooth it out, um, you can see that this the lip here gets really sharp and pointy and thin. And I want to stop that from happening. So go back to edge mode, shift right click, and insert edge loop. And I'm going to add uh, probably three edge loops here. I'm going to add one about here, one on the inside. It's at three. See how that feels. And that might actually be enough. I'll go back into object mode so I can get a better sense of what that looks like. Um, I'm going to add one more. Let's go back into edge mode. I've got my edge loop tool still there. I'm going to add one right in the center and then I'm just going to move it up just a little bit give a little contour to that lip okay so now as I smooth it out it's just slightly more pleasing it's a it's a very minor detail but that's going to help catch the light really nicely okay so we're pretty close on this mug the, I mean, the body of the mug itself is done, but now we need to do the tricky part, which is the handle. Okay, let's take a look at this handle real quick. And the way that I'm going to do this, now you can see that my handle is a little bit, slightly more square than, uh, than the reference, especially where it joins the mug, but that's okay. Uh, the way that we're going to do this is we're going to add a couple more edge loops that are going to define the bounds of the of the handle and then we're going to extrude out from there bend them around and then merge them together okay so that's that's where we're going with this follow along and we'll all be okay now would be a good time to save just because it's a good habit to be in save early save often um, Okay, so the handles, we want to define where, uh, where they're going to be coming from. So I'm going to go and do this in front view. And I've got my reference here. And I don't have to be exact. This isn't surgery or anything like that. Uh, I've got my edge loop tool still active. And I'm going to put one about here. 
And then one, if I look on this reference, the bottom of the handle kind of starts where the curve uh, starts. So I can leave that one there, and then I just need the, uh, the center two. So the way that I'm going to do that to make sure that the, d the thicknesses are even is I'm going to double click on my edge loop tool here to bring up the tool settings. You can also get there if you shift right click, insert edge loop tool and click on the box. It'll bring this up. I'm going to click multiple edge loops and by default it's at two, which is what I want. And then I'm going to add two edge loops in the center there. Hit R to bring up my scale tool and scale them vertically away from each other. And right about there. Okay, so this and this are going to be where the handle is going to come from. Okay, so I've got that defined. And as I look at this, I'm just thinking about this bottom curve here. I want to bring that down a little bit more, I think. So I'm going to go into vertex mode. And this is kind of part of my process always, is I'm always reevaluating the, the form of what I'm modeling and, and making adjustments as I go. I'm going to select all of these vertices. So I'm leaving this little base lip alone. But everything else, so just I just click and drag across here. And I'm just going to move it down just a little bit. Okay, just make that little adjustment. And this distance and this distance are still the same because I moved both edge loops at the same time. Okay, so now when I hit three, it's a it's a slightly slightly more squared off version, which I think I like. If not, I can always change it again later. But um, yeah, let's go with that. So the handle. The way that the handle is going to work, let me let me uh, jump back to perspective view. Is the handle is going to get extruded from basically these two faces. But if I extrude them now, you can see that these two faces are not uh, lined up with the world. Okay, they're they're slightly off because I don't have a face that is perfectly. Uh, along the x-axis. I've got a, a vertex that is. So what I'm going to do is rotate the entire object. Uh, so I'm going to do this in object mode. And I want to rotate around the y-axis. And I want to rotate 11.25. And I'll tell you why I chose that specific number uh, here in a second. But what that does is it, mo it rotates the cup so that now I have a face perfectly in line with the x-axis. Okay. Now, how I came to that number 11.25. When I created, uh, there we go. When I created the the cup, there are 16 subdivisions. Right, there's a little bit of geometry involved here. There's 16 sides. And I want to rotate it. I wanted to rotate it so that I went from a, a vertex to the middle of a side. So that's like half of half a section. So what you do is you take 360 degrees because that's what a circle is. 360 degrees. Divide that by your number of sides. Okay, 22.5, and then divide that by two because you want to go from halfway across a face. Then you get 11.25. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. A little bit of geometry. Or try to stay away from math as much as possible. But every once in a while, it will creep in. Um, now, if uh, if you get yourself into some sort of a pickle and you just can't figure out what the math is, something sometimes what I do is I will just select the whole thing and just kind of free rotate it around the axis until I get to where I think it's close. Uh, and then just assume that the math is going to work out so that it's going to be a more specific number 
and then round from there. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, but if you can be exact, it's going to make the rest of this a whole lot easier. So 11.25 is the magic number today. So from there, we can get back into, into uh, face mode and grab our faces. Now, you see that these faces are probably a little bit wide from the reference. Um, you know, we could have initially started with more subdivisions, and then this would be narrower. Um, I can also adjust the shape a little bit. Oops, go back to edge mode. I'm going to scale these closer to each other, so it's going to square those off a little bit and just make that ex initial extrusion a little bit cleaner. Okay. So I've got my two faces, and now I'm ready to start extruding. Uh, actually, let me make sure I'm in there. I want the side view. I've been rotating my view around so much I forgot which way was front. Um, it's the positive x-axis is the side that I'm going to extrude from. So if you check your, your side and your front view, you can see where I have selected. But I'm going to extrude these out, and first I'm going to start with just a, a little ex extrusion to get this lip. Then I'll extrude again to make this transition, and then we'll continue around. So with the faces selected, and I hit W to bring up my move tool. And again, you can just hold down shift and then drag out along the X axis. And this is going to go about that much. Don't need to go any further than that for the first extrusion. All right, so if you hit three right now, you just get a lumpy, get a lumpy side. But I think you can start to see how this is going to work. Uh, now I'm going to extrude one more time. And we'll go about to there. And then I want to scale these down. Uh, it's about there, I think. And I'm, I'll scale them widthwise as well. Okay. Now, obviously, this is not the shape that we want. Uh, so we need to move them back up. And I'm somebody that likes to work as, as precisely as possible, whenever possible. I know most most man-made things are not perfect, um, and adding adding a little bit of um, imperfection is actually one of the steps to realism. But uh, in this particular case, realism be damned, we're going to be precise. So I'm going to select this first uh, face, and what I want to do is I want to align this face with the top edge here. Okay, and so what I'm going to do, I'm going to turn on point snapping, uh, hold down the D key, which is going to adjust my pivot center. I'm going to move it up to snap along this edge. Let go of the D key, and then I can snap my face up to there. And now it's perfectly in line with the top of the handle. Okay. Um, Although, as you look at the reference, it is actually slightly lower. But let's keep it, let's keep it exact for now, because I just want you to, to know how to make these specific adjustments, because this is something that can come in uh, handy. So we'll do this on the bottom one as well. So I have the face selected. I have point snapping enabled. OK, so I've got the face selected point snapping. I'm going to hold down the D key, which is going to allow me to move my pivot point. And just vertically, I'm going to move it and I'm going to hover over one of these bottom vertices of the face to snap it in line with that. Okay, So now my pivot point is there. One note is if you then deselect that face and go back to it, that pivot point is going to reset. Okay, So changing these pivot points, it's not like in object mode where it stays. When you're just in component mode, it's only while you have that selected. So D key, snap it to that point, let go of the D key, and then you can snap it down to one of these bottom vertices. And now that's in line. 
slight issue that I didn't realize until very recently. Um, if I look in front view, you can see that these faces are not aligned. They should be flat. I shouldn't be able to actually see that face. Uh, so, as I was undoing and figuring out where everything went wrong, um, it was when I scaled them in. And the reason for that is if we go to top view, look at my scale manipulators. They are not in line with the world. They are in line with the object. Uh, they are actually rotated 11.25 degrees because that's what the object is rotated. So, if you go to your uh, scale tool settings, you can just double click on the scale tool on the left side. You've got axis orientation. You want to set that to world. And now it'll be in line with the world. And everything will be better. So, that was the problem. We've now fixed it. Uh, now I can go back in and scale them back in. And I'm going to be slightly sloppy here because in the reference they aren't perfectly aligned, so I will keep them, turn off snapping, keep them a little bit lower. Just like that face. And we'll bring it just shy of even. Trying to roughly match the angles here. But that, now, we can continue extruding out and around. So I'll select both faces again. I think I have an extra face selected. Yes, I do. Just those two faces. And let me get rid of the tool settings so I have some screen available. Looking at my reference, I have my reference open on the other screen uh, so I can constantly see it. I'm going to extrude out, so hold down, whoops. So I deselect the faces. Uh, hold down shift, click and drag out to about there, which will be about the center of the handle. And then I'm going to do that one more time. Shift, click and drag to about there. Okay, so I kind of have even, these are roughly even. I'll go a little bit more. Um, and then one more. I'll go to about there. And then we need to bring these down and, and connect them. So this might get a little bit tricky. Because what I want to do is I want a continuous face loop around here. And if I just extrude down and connect these two faces, I won't have that. Um, it will be, it just won't be a continuous face loop, and I want that. So it's just easier to adjust um, and refine the, the shape later if we spend a little bit more time now. So what I want to do is kind of do like a segmented turning of the corner. Um, so I'm going to select this edge and this edge. OK, you can see what I have there. I'm going to bring them in a little bit. Think about this. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Actually, this doesn't have to be as complicated as I made it before. I'm just going to bring that in, and then I'm going to select these two faces. And shift right click, extrude the face. I'm going to hit R to scale, and scale them down towards each other. OK? Why I scaled immediately after the extrude instead of just using the, the extrude manipulators is, I mean, as you saw, let me undo that far enough so that I make sure that I did. Okay. So as I select these faces and hit extrude, you can see the direction of the, of the manipulator. And I can't really get them to go just vertically. Okay, you can see that's what the thickness does. 
uh, local translate Z does the same thing. So if I hit R to go to the scale tool, now I've got my world orientations and I can scale them down towards each other. Okay. And so I'll, st I'll leave it right about there. Okay, that's good. Uh, now what I want to do is delete those faces and then I can bridge the the remaining. So I've got, I'm just going to double click on both edge loops, uh, shift right click, bridge, and I'm going to add one division here. It's going to give me a line, an, an edge loop right in the center. At this point we have the, the bulk of our geometry made. If I hit 3 on the number pad and smooth it out, you can see we're close, but not quite there. So. The rest of the, the modeling process here is just refining. Um, we've established all of the main geometries. Um, now we just need to get it looking right. So uh, I'm going to select this top edge loop and I'm going to go to the slide edge tool and move it closer to the corner. And it's just middle mouse button, click and drag. And we'll get that up there. And this bottom one, I will slide that down about there. And then I want to even these out. So I'm going to scale those closer together. Okay. Um, looking at my reference and looking at this mug, this handle just in general feels a bit large. So I'm going to go into vertex mode. Select all of those. Move it in. Select these, move it in a little bit more. Okay. Next, I want to kind of round out the corners. So in edge mode, I'm going to select the, this corner edge and this corner edge, the whole, the whole edge loop. Okay. I'm gonna scale them down a little bit, and I'm going to move them in. And obviously, I'm, I'm screwing up the geometry, so now we have to fix that too. So take these two edge loops, move those in. And we'll move these in a little bit too. Um, these bottom edges, I'm just going to do this from the side view. There we go. Just trying to get a nice round form here. Okay, I'm going to select this center edge loop here and pull it out a little bit. Again, just rounding off that form. And I'll select go into vertex mode now. I'm going to select these, pull those down a little bit. Select these, pull these up a little bit, continuing just to, to round that out. I'll hit three on the number pad, see how we're doing. Doing okay. So, I'm going to select these edges. Actually, I'm going to select all of this, all of these vertices. I'm just going to move them in. I want to ease that transition a little bit. That feels that feels a lot better. Okay. So I've got that. Um, I'm going to add another edge loop. A couple more edge loops, actually. Add one here. Oops. Go to my settings. Go back to equal distance from edge, so I'm just adding one edge loop at a time. I'll add one there, keep that a little bit sharp. Add one there. And then I've got one, two, three, four more edge loops to add. Well, actually, three. So I'm going to add this one, and I want to keep this one in the center. 
Now this seems like a, a big, long, complicated edge loop, and it kind of is, but that's one of the reasons why I wanted to keep this edge flow around here, is it now brings all of these together. All right, but I want to keep it, I want this to be exactly in the center. So I'm going to go to my edge loop options, go to multiple edge loops, and set it to one. But with the equal multiplier on, when I add it, it's going to add it exactly in the center. Uh, again, that's my perfectionism sneaking out. Okay. So that's in the center. And then I want to add an edge loop. Whoops. An edge loop here. That's interesting. I don't know why I put that there. Let me go to relative distance from edge. There we go. Okay, add one in the center there, and I'm going to add one in the center on the underside. And these are going to help me, again, round out this handle. So what I want to do is I want to take these corner uh, faces, or excuse me, edges. So I'm going to select all of these. And all of these. Okay, and I'm going to scale them in a little bit to kind of round them out. And then I'm going to take these edge loops, or these edges, not the whole loops, bring those in a little bit. I'm going to take these and bring them up a little bit. I'm just rounding out the whole thing. Okay. Take these two up here, bring them down a little. Actually, let's go. Yeah, that'll be fine. Just those two. In just a little bit. I don't need, doesn't need to be extreme. just enough to help the rounded form. Okay, you can check that in uh, smooth preview. That's looking pretty good. This edge is a, maybe a little harsh. So to fix that, I'm going to select this edge right here. And I believe it is under, where is it? I can't remember where it is in the menu. Average, average vertices? Yeah, that scales it down a little bit too much though. How to slide it. So shift right click, slide edge tool. Middle click and drag. Just move that out a little bit. Again, double check my smooth preview. It's looking okay. Still not my favorite connection, but I suppose it's not too far off from, uh, from what we see in the reference. So one last thing that I want to do and this is a very kind of subtle thing that you might not notice. Um, but when we added this edge loop right here, okay, the, it basically created a flat spot in the side of the mug that can be difficult to see, but it is there. Um, might be easier to see in object mode. 
You can kind of you can kind of see it there as you move around it. Okay, it's it's subtle, but it's there, and especially when lights start shining on it, it'll be more noticeable. And so I just want to smooth that out a little bit, just by taking uh, this edge, and I'm just gonna take that edge, this edge. around to about there and I'm just going to pull them out a little bit okay, just to keep that feeling rounded and smooth and I think we can call that good on the mug as I take a step back these are feeling a little bit thick to me, so I'm going to go and select these four faces here, and these four faces here, and scale them away from each other. Just to kind of thin that out a little bit. And then I'll adjust these edges as well so that they stay in the center and it doesn't feel pinched. You know, as simple as an object as this is, you know, you can spend quite a bit of time just doing the final tweaks and adjustments. Um, kind of getting the form, it takes about 20% of the time and then refining it is the other 80%. I just want to keep edges and faces feeling smooth and even, so this is a little bit uneven, so I'm just going to move that up in the center and keep, try to keep the polygons uh, the same size as much as possible. Just going to help everything feeling even. this one and right about there okay that's better I'll stop adjusting uh, now we can move on to turn the ground back on uh, now we can move on to lights and materials and in rendering Um, with the exception of the back wall, which I guess we could do real quick, because it's just take the ground plane, Command D to duplicate, move it back, and then rotate it around the X axis 90 degrees, and congratulations, you've made a wall. That's literally all I did. That's all you need to do. It's just something that that will have will give it a simple texture, and we'll give throw some light at it. Um, and that's enough. So, uh, before we actually start adding materials and lights and cameras, let's take a moment to look at this reference. I'm switching from the two-tone mug reference to the ember mug reference. Okay, if you want to follow along with me pointing at pictures. Uh, and I'm going to keep a consistent tone. I like the colors. I like that it's light, but it still has some contrast and it still has some drama. So the, the materials are going to be fairly simple. Only, only the ground is going to get a texture and a bump map. Everything else is just going to be a slightly adjusted base shader. And uh, the camera is straight on, just slightly above the mug so we can see into it a little bit, but not enough to know if it's full or empty. If you wanted to take the render after the fact and go into Photoshop and put some steam rising off of it, you could. Um, or later in the semester when we hopefully finally get to 
physical simulations. You could maybe even do it for real. Um, so that's uh, that's camera. Also, being that this is a close-up, uh, I'm assuming, and it, it looks to be a longer lens. So we'll go with like an 85 millimeter lens. And then uh, the lighting. I really like the, the lighting on this one. We've got a strong left side key. We've got a subtle right side fill. Um, and then we've got a strong backlight that's given this nice dramatic shadow and a little bit of warmth and these really nice highlights on the rim and on the handle. And then there's a fourth light here just hitting the backdrop and giving a, a, a gradient on the backdrop so it's not just a flat color. Okay, so that's where we're going. Uh, the first thing that we need to do in our scene, uh, after we save it, is to set up a camera so that we can uh, see what the hell we're doing. So, uh, first I'm going to split the view in two. So I'm going to click this uh, two frame preset. Okay, so now I've got a front and a perspective view. I'm going to go up to create cameras, and I'm just going to do a simple camera. I don't need an aim or an aim and an up, just a regular old camera. Okay, and then on my left view, uh, viewport, I'm going to go to Panels, Perspective, and Camera 1. So now I'm looking through that camera. Uh, but I'm going to make all of my adjustments in the perspective view. I'm just going to use that as reference. So I'm going to move the camera up and back, but I'm not going to move it left and right. I'm going to keep the Translate X at 0 because I want to keep it centered. I'm just going to move it up and back. Now, uh, I'm going to go to my attribute editor, and I've got all of my camera options. By default, the focal length, which is the lens uh, of the camera, is set to 35 millimeters. I'm going to go to 85, which is a really nice close-up lens. It's also going to—it narrows the field of view, so you don't have to worry about making a giant background to cover all of the negative space. Um, I'm also going to let's see. Uh, film gate, we'll set, leave it at user. And then if we go down to display options, I want to display the film gate and set my overscan. I'm going to set it to 2, which in the split view is going to show me the full bounds of my view. Okay. You can also adjust the gate mask color if you need it to stand out a little bit more, and the opacity. Uh, next, I want to set my um, image size. So I'm going to go to my render options, which is this clapboard with a little gear right up here. And you want to be using Arnold Renderer, which is what we're, we're switching to from now on. If you don't have Arnold um, available, it's installed. It's bundled with Maya um, 2018, but you might need to activate the plugin. To do that, go to Windows. Uh, settings Preferences and Plugin Manager. Windows Settings Preferences, Plugin Manager, and then uh, I believe it's type, was it MT? You got MTOA Bundle. Okay? And then you just want to make sure that these are set to load and auto load. Click Refresh and it will pop up. Okay, so that's if you don't have Arnold already available. Um, so set your render using Arnold Renderer. And we've got uh, EXR is what we're going to stick with. We don't need to worry about file names. Um, renderable camera is going to be camera one. And then presets, we're going to go with 1K square. Uh, I did a, a more traditional aspect ratio from my preview. But if we look here, there's not really anything on the sides that's terribly exciting. So we don't need to spend the time rendering you know, the outsides of the frame. So I'm just going to go with square. 1024 by 1024 is fine. Uh, and then in my Arnold Renderer tab, this is where we're going to adjust the, the uh, quality settings, but I'm not going to worry about that right now. I just wanted to point out that that's where that is. So um, let's see. I want to display resolution. Yeah, I'm, I actually want to display resolution and not film gate, because resolution is governed by what I just uh, changed. So. I've got the square, and now I want to set my composition. So I'm going to move the camera back a little bit more. And uh, I'm going to, whoops. 
I want to go to my side view. I'm going to zoom out here. Make sure the camera is just a little bit above the mug. And then I'm going to rotate it down. Something like that. I think will be nice. Uh, sure. Oh, maybe a little, a little more negative space. I like negative space. And then... Yeah, okay. We will leave it at that. We can make adjustments later if necessary. I can also adjust my overscan to like 1.8. I can even go closer. Yeah, okay, 1.4. Um, I just want to make sure I can see the full bounds so I know what the full uh, frame is. And here I'll go back to perspective. And... Right, so now if we go to our Arnold shelf up here, this tab, okay, we've got some light options, and then over here we've got some render options. Um, you can bring up the render view, and you can actually just hit render. So I'm going to hit render, and let's see what happens. We get a big old black screen. A whole lot of nothing. Uh, and that's because we don't have any lights in this scene. So let's add some lights. Uh, we've already kind of gone through what lights are in the scene. So uh, we're going to use Arnold lights for this. And it's going to be actually exclusively with these uh, area lights. So it's this first option in the Arnold tab is the area lights. So I'm just going to uh, start with one. And I'm going to move it over, bring it up. And this one is going to be kind of our key light. Come on. Why are we not scaling? So I restarted and now I can get the light to scale. So I just want to go a little bit skinnier with this one. And then I'm going to move it around the side of the, of the mug, somewhere around here. And then we're going to rotate it so that it is pointing at the, at the mug. Um, if you need to change views in, uh, in this perspective panel, if you hold down shift, or not, I'm sorry, not shift, space, you're going to bring up this menu, and then if you hold down the right mouse button, you've got your viewport options here. So you got perspective, left, top, back, front, bottom, right, new camera, and then there's a hotbox style option. Um, and so from here, you can switch to, like, for instance, top view. And then you can make, you know, uh, make your changes from here. So I want to point it, make sure it's pointing at the mug. And then I want to go into front view, so we're going to hold down space, hold down right mouse button, and go to front view. Now what's really nice about these context menus, and especially for adjusting views, is it's gesture based. So you don't have to wait for the menu to pop up if you know where you want to go. So as you get used to this, you know that perspective view is up. You can just hit space right, right right mouse and move the mouse up and you can switch to it and then okay so if you if you know where you're going you can make these uh, adjustments very quickly um, but in slow-mo it's space right mouse button and then choose your angle so um, I do want to tilt this down a little bit just a little bit and move it up okay now, I'm going to hit render again in my Arnold render view. And on the projector, you can maybe barely see that there's something here. But you can't really see it 
uh, anywhere else. So what we want to do, I'm going to close that and just relaunch it, um, is with the light se uh, selected in the attribute editor under area light shape one, which by the way, I should name this, I'm going to name this key light. Okay, go back to my attribute editor. So key light shape, so it's the shape tab. Uh, we have intensity and exposure. So I'm going to set the intensity to three and the exposure to five. And then this is what I get. Now I'm just looking at the wrong angle. So I want to go to view, uh, let's see, not view. Render, camera, camera. Okay, so now I'm rendering the camera. Okay, so um, intensity and exposure are, they make kind of the same adjustments to the light. It's, it's they're both about intensity. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the technical difference is and I haven't looked it up, but uh, from what I understand, intensity is kind of a linear scale and then exposure is more of an exponential scale. So as you go intensity from one to two to three, it's, it's one to two is doubling it and then two to four would be doubling it and then exposure, every whole number is doubling it. So one to two is doubling it, two to three is doubling it. Um, but I'll just keep it at three and five because that's what I used before and it worked and that looks good. Now I can see things. Um, you also have this uh, color temperature option, which I am going to use. So color temperature, um, not all white light is created equal. Some of it is more amber. So you got like, if you go really low, you're in like the fire range. And then right about 3200 is tungsten light. So think of like a traditional light, light bulb on a, uh, on a desk lamp. And then as we move up, 5600 is the sun is daylight. 6000 is like a cloudy day outside. And then you can keep going uh, more towards the blue side of the spectrum. And actually, I'm going to keep this. Uh, I'm going to go about 8000 for this one. I don't know, I'll dial it back, 7,000. Okay, so just a very slight bit of blue. Okay, so there's the key light. Feeling pretty good about that. Now let's add in uh, the fill light. Fill light is going to be another uh, just area light. I'm going to move it over here, and this one is going to be um, just straight over, and I'm going to rotate this. Uh, let's just, there we go. I'm just going to rotate it 90 degrees. I'm going to move it up so it's not halfway in the floor. And I will scale it up just a little bit too. Okay, and maybe I'll move it, move it forward a little bit so it wraps just a little bit around. Okay. Now, um, in the render view, you can keep an eye on this. I'm going to go to the attribute editor. I'm going to set the intensity again to 3. You can see it's starting to come up. And then the exposure, I'm going to go to like 2.25. That might be too much. Let's go to just, let's try 1.5. That looks better. Uh, then I'm going to use color temperature for this as well. And I'm going to go to 12,000. I want a nice blue fill on this. Okay. Obviously, all these adjustments can be tweaked later, especially once we get materials on there. I just want to establish the lighting first. So I've got that. Uh, let's move on to the next light, which is going to be the backlight. Oh, before I do that, I'm going to name this light. This is going to be fill light. So another light, name this one. This one is going to be backlight. And I'm going to move it, as you might expect, behind the mug. Move it up. I'm going to scale this down um, because the smaller the source, the harder the shadows. And I want a relatively hard shadow uh, 
here. So you can see in the in previous render, it's a relatively hard shadow. It does get a little bit soft, but um, it's not a big soft light like uh, the fill light is that we just did. So um, you can actually see even on this render that the fill light that is there isn't really casting a shadow because it is so subtle. It's just to bring up the dark, the shadows, so they're not quite so dark. So, um, so I've got the the key light added. You can see uh, by this little line right here that it's pointing backwards. So I need to rotate this 180 degrees so that it's pointing forward, and rotate it down just a little bit. And let's go to our attribute editor and adjust the intensity to 3, an exposure of 5, and we'll use color temperature again and we're just going to warm this up actually. So as I'm looking at the render view, something in the neighborhood of 4800 looks pretty good. Okay. And so as I'm looking at this and, and trying to just determine if this is where I want the light, I'm looking at where the highlights are falling, I'm looking at the shadow, um, and that's looking pretty good to me. Okay, so um, before I do the, the background light that, that lights the, the back wall, let's get into the materials, uh, because that's going to be a lot of kind of rendering, um, and if we don't need to calculate that back wall light, um, it's just going to save time a little bit. Uh, also, by now, if you haven't noticed, the Arnold render view is an IPR renderer in, in that it's always updating. Um, there isn't a non-IPR version of, of Arnold, uh, of the Arnold render view. So it's always updating, which is great. Just But keep that in mind so you don't just leave this open forever and have it slowing down the computer in the background if you're not using it. So uh, it's time to do some materials. And like I said, these are going to be relatively simple uh, materials. They are going to be Arnold uh, materials, which is a little bit new. Uh, so I'm going to start with, well, first let's go into this. Um, also, I know we were working with RenderMan last semester, and when you hit like 6 or 7 on the number pad, nothing really happened because RenderMan didn't integrate that well with Maya, or with the viewport anyway. Uh, Arnold, however, does. So if I hit 7 on the number pad, uh, you can actually see a proper lighting preview, and you can see where the lights are, and it looks pretty cool. Um, and you can do that in your camera view as well to get a sense of how that's going to look. So, just something to keep in mind. And when we add textures, those will also you'll see a, a preview of that in the viewport as well, which is really nice. So, shaders and materials. I'm going to open up the hypershade because we're still using that. And uh, you can see here we have this Arnold uh, tab section. And we want to go to shaders. And all the, sh all the materials that we build, all the shaders that we build, are going to be using the standard surface, AI standard surface. So I'm going to click on that once. I'm going to call this, um, I'm going to say mat underscore mug. So mat for material uh, underscore mug, just to help. Uh, help it stand out. And then we're just going to really concern ourselves right now with the base and the specular. So you can kind of think of base as the diffuse um, and then specular is still specular. So we've got the weight which is how much of that is going to be applied to the mug. Um, and then we've got the color, roughness, and metalness. So. Uh, so, in order to see these adjustments, we need to apply this shader to the mug. So, let's select the mug, right-click on the material, and assign material to selection. Okay, that's one way you can do it. Uh, you can see it automatically updates, and now it's shiny. Uh, another way that you could do it is you just right-click on the mug in the viewport, go down to assign existing material, and choose material mug. Okay couple ways to skin a cat. Um, so I'm going to leave this open on the side. Let's see, I'm going to figure out the best way to do this. 
because there's a lot going on here. Let's collapse that a little bit. Oh, actually, I can. I'm just going to close that for a minute because we can use the material viewer here. So I've got my mug uh, material, and uh, so the weight is kind of how much of the diffuse color is being used. I'm going to crank that all the way up to one. I don't see any reason not to have that at one. The color. Um, is by default a pure white. Nothing is really ever pure white, so we can maybe back that off a touch. And if you wanted to add just a little bit of color to it, you know, maybe we do a little bit of a cream color. You could do that just to give it a little bit of uh, differentiation. Uh, and then specular. So if I turn the weight of specular all the way down. You look at the preview and all of the highlights go away and now it feels like a soft plastic kind of surface. So we can bring that specular back in a little bit. Okay, maybe halfway. And now we're starting to see some highlights, but it doesn't feel quite as high sheen and high gloss as it did before. Um, you can also adjust the specular color, so if you want these highlights to be a little bit different, it can. And then we've got uh, roughness. So watch this specular highlight as I increase the roughness. See it's kind of kind of it's gonna spread out and it's gonna lessen in intensity. It's also gonna take a little bit longer to render. Okay, so now it's a lot more subtle there. Maybe I'll split the difference. Okay. So that's a little bit of roughness. Computer is slowing down because I'm screen recording and trying to render, but um, go down a little bit lower. Now, in the, in the coming weeks, we'll get more in depth in, in these shaders and all of the options. Um, but uh, for now, we'll just focus on these. Um, I will mention, though, that there are, if you go back up to where you name the material, there's a bunch of presets Okay, that can be good starting points for a lot of things. You know, there's car paints and there's clay and chrome and gold and milk, uh, rubber. Um, not as many presets as there were in RenderMan, but still a, a, a healthy number that, that'll that serve as a good starting point for most things. Um, so I've got the material roughly where I want it. Let's open up the render view again and check it here. Okay. Um, so I'm going to give this a little bit little time to render. If I want to do just a region of rendering, this button right up here, this, the blue square with the white outlines, I can click that and then drag across the mug and now it's just going to refresh that section. It's not going to worry about rendering all the other stuff. <clears throat> and since I'm just worried about the material right now, that will work great. I'm going to look at my preview again. Uh, I am going to increase the roughness of the specularity a little bit more. So I'll bring this onto the screen so you can see it. Somewhere in there. I want to be able to tell where the light's coming from on the mug, but I don't want it to be super obvious. So maybe like 0.3. And we'll go 0.25. Okay, because I also want to make sure that I have a nice highlight on the rim here and on the handle. So that's going to require adjusting the, the backlight. So I'll move this over. Here's the light. We can bring it in a little bit. Maybe bring it lower. This is where I wish I had more screen real estate. Oh yeah, so you can see the light is pointing down and is hitting low, so I'll bring this up. I'll bring it closer. Rotate it down a little bit. Really want to make sure I'm getting a good highlight there. And it looks kind of blotchy now, but as this renders out, it'll smooth out too. So you can see that's looking better. Getting some nice highlight there. 
I'm pretty happy with that. Not quite as happy with my mug shape. I think it's feeling a little bit short, but I'll ignore that for now. Um, great. So that is the mug texture taken care of. Let's uh, let's look at the ground texture and, and material. So the ground, I'm going to start in a, a similar spot. So in the hypershade, I'm going to add a new AI standard surface. I'm going to call this mat underscore ground. And I'm going to turn the specular mostly off and bump the roughness a little bit. Okay. And I'm going to select the ground plane, right click on it, assign, uh, assign my ground material to it. So you see how the 3D port uh, viewport responds. I can also adjust my render area so that it's only on, oh, let's see. There we go. So it's only rendering the parts that I need it to. And then I'll hit play again. There we go. Okay. So when I created this, you can see that, that the reference has a, a textured ground. And that's what I wanted to recreate. So without getting into image textures too much. Um, we did not doing any UV unwrapping or anything like that. Uh, I did find a, a relatively simple, straightforward way to get a more interesting ground texture. So the way that we're going to do that is, is by applying two separate textures, one for the color and one for the bump map. So for the color, let me select my ground material. And right here, uh, under color to the, to the right, we have this checkerboard pattern. Okay, that, that, whenever that is next to an attribute, that means you can use a texture to control that attribute. So I'm going to click on that. It's going to open up a create render node window. And I want to go to, uh, I believe it's just... Uh, let's see, I want to go to Arnold Texture and Noise. Okay, so now that we have the noise, I'm going to I'm going to change my material viewer from Shader Ball just to a plane because I just want to look at and see what the color is doing. Uh, I'm also going to need to close my render view. You can see you can actually see it popping up a little bit there, which you know what? might be all I need. Oops, go one to one. Um, that actually looks better than however I did it before, so that works for me. Um, what this is doing is it's, it's called a procedural texture. It's not an image texture, it's mathematically generated, um, which is great when you don't want to UV unwrap things, even though a plane is pretty easy to do. Um, you've got some some options to control this. So as I adjust, for instance, the octaves, you'll see how the noise uh, pattern adjusts itself. Um, I can adjust distortion. I can get really weird with it if I want to. You can also adjust the colors. So if I don't want it to go from black to white, which is the default, uh, I can go from a kind of a muted dark bluish gray. Maybe something like that to a lighter muted blue. Something like that. Okay, so we're still getting some patterns, but just adding a little bit more color to it. Um, I'm going to really desaturate it, though. I don't want that much color in there. And 
I'm also going to lighten it. I want to keep these kind of close together. I want it to be a pretty subtle uh, difference. I can actually just use these sliders. Yeah, I'll brighten that up a little bit. Okay, so it's got texture, but it's not really drawing attention to itself. Something like that will work just fine. Okay, so that's really the only adjustments I'm going to make there. I'm going to go back to my ground texture, or uh, shader. And so that's it for color and specularity. I'm going to keep super subtle. Then if you scroll down to geometry, this is where you can add a bump map. So for those that don't know, a bump map, uh, that's what I used here to get this kind of bumpy texture. Uh, it's a way to kind of trick the renderer into thinking there's texture there. It affects the way that light interacts with the surface without actually add or adding more geometry. So there's something called a displacement map, which actually moves geometry around. Um, and you tend to need a lot of vertices very close together in order to get good displacement. Um, whereas a bump map keeps the surface flat, but the light interacts with it in a way that makes it look like there's texture there. So it's just kind of a, it's kind of a cheat, but it's also very much a standard thing to do. Now for the bump map, um, I'm going to keep this open so I can see it. Uh, bump mapping, and we've got another texture slot, so I'm going to click on that. And if we go back to Arnold Texture, we've got AI Image. I'll click on that. And I've got an error. What is that saying? Invalid image file. Well, I haven't given you an image file yet. Of course it's invalid. Um, we need to load the image. So if we... I'm going to right-click on this ground shader and go to Graph Network. You can see all of the nodes that are involved in this network, and we can zoom in on them. Bump right here is the image node, and here we've got image name. Okay, I'll go through that again. I'm going to do that a little fast. Um, we've got our ground material, our shader network, which is becoming a network as we keep adding nodes and components to it. But if you right-click on that and Graph Network, you can see here's the noise texture that we just added to the color. I'll zoom in here so you can actually see it on the recording. Um, we're take, we took the color of the noise and applied it to the color, the base color of the ground shader. All right, and now we're taking, well, we are going to take an image texture and apply that uh, to the bump and the normal value of the ground. So I'm gonna click on the image node and we've got this image name field. Click on the folder. And actually, before I do that, this is where that um, concrete texture is going to come into play. So I'm going to open up a couple of windows here. First, I'm going to navigate to where I have my cement texture. Okay, this is the texture. It's just a regular old close up of cement. Super exciting. And then in my project structure, uh, coffee mug is my project, I want to go to the source images folder, and that's where I want to put the cement texture. Okay. When I do that, now I can go to my image attributes, click the folder, and I don't know why this is going to scenes. I want to go to Source Images and choose Cement Texture. Click Load. It's going to take a second. And then there's the render view. Now, as a general rule, um, most of the time when you add a bump map, it comes in way too strong. Way too strong. As you can see by these, all these weird black spots. So what we want to do is we want to go to this Bump 2D node. And this bump depth is what we want to adjust. So you can go from negative 5 to positive 5. So you can kind of reverse the bump if you want. Um, but I just want to go 
even at like 0 0.036 is still a bit strong. Okay, subtlety is key here with bump maps. So I'm going to go to 0 0.008. And now we're, we'll look at that as it renders. It's going to take a second. You can see it's super subtle. But I think that's going to work. Okay. Yeah, I think I'm, I think I'm good with that. Again, we can adjust that later if we need to. Um, so the last shader that we need to do, uh, we need to add a shader for the back wall and a light for it. So the shader is going to be super simple. I'm going to add another standard surface. I'm going to call this matte wall. And I'm going to go up to specular. I'm going to turn that off all the way down to zero. Turn the weight all the way up to one. And that's about it. Then I can go to my viewport, select the back wall. Uh, whoops, object mode. Right click, assign existing material and matte wall. And then we just need to add another light, which the way that I did this one is I just put this in a spot that would kind of cast a gradient across the back wall. You can also adjust the intensity. So we'll go three and you can try five. That might be too strong, but we'll start there. Look at our render view. I'll turn off that, okay. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's maybe a little bit strong and obvious and not very interesting. Uh, so I'm going to rotate this a little bit more. We'll move it down a little bit. Let's see. Just want to try to get a scale it down a little bit. Just playing around with it to get something. Yeah, that'll work. Okay, so that is that's about it as far as setting up this render. Um, we've got. A simple glossy material there. Now we can just kind of take a step back and look at any adjustments that we might want to make. So I can think of a couple that I want to make real quick. I'm going to go to my mug, hit F to frame it up, and I'm going to just make it a little bit taller. So from front view, I'm going to select this top chunk of vertices, just move it up a little bit. And I'm going to select this bottom edge loop here. And I'm going to move that up a little bit too, just to maybe round that over a little bit more. OK. And I'm going to move the camera down a little bit too, I think. Okay, so I think that's about it as far as getting this clean look. It's slightly different than the first time I did it, but not much. Um, I do like having that, that tighter specular highlight, so maybe I'll go back to my hypershade and grab the mug material, and I'm going to bring the roughness. Actually, I'm going to increase the, the weight of the specular, so we're going to just going to get more of that in general. And then I think what I need to do is just move that in closer. So I'll go to top view here. I'll just move it in closer. And I'll just bring the exposure down a little bit. And 
And then well, I'll bring that roughness down a little bit too. That's better. Okay, so the last thing that we have to do is uh, set our render quality settings. So you can see the samples for Arnold work a bit different than RenderMan or the internal um, render engine. And again, I've been working in my or in Arnold for two days, so I don't have the most complete understanding, but I do know it a little bit, and I'm going to give you a, that little bit of knowledge. I go to your render settings and go to Arnold Renderer. Here's your sampling options. Now these are. It's not. You know, if you if you set this to three passes, it's not just doing three passes. It's three times sixty-four or something. So it's it's a multiples. It's not just flat three. Um, but we'll set. I'm going to set the diffuse and the specular to five. I don't have any transmission materials. Uh, SSS is subsurface scattering. I don't have any of that going on. I don't have any uh, volumetrics, so I don't have to worry about any of that. Uh, camera. I'll bump to five as well. Um, so it'll take a little bit of time to render, but it should get rid of all of the noise that we're seeing here and look pretty good by the end of it. So um, I'm just going to let this go. You see it says rendering down in the corner. Uh, when it's done, instead of saying rendering, it'll have the render time um, down there. So I'm going to pause the recording and come back when that's done. So uh, it's finished rendering. It took six minutes and 33 seconds. Um, now to save it, you just have to go to File, Save Image, and we can choose what we want to save it as. You can see by default it goes into the Images folder, which is great. So I will call it Coffee Mug, and I'll just name it 01 in case I do multiple versions. Click Save, and then I can go into my Finder and navigate to my coffee mug project, go to my images folder, and there is the JPEG that it saved out. If you wanted to save out a multi-layer EXR, instead of file save, you'd say save EXR. Um, you could also check the box to save final images, which I believe, I'm assuming would be an automatic thing, but I don't know for sure because I've not done it yet. Again, only two days in our old so far. Um, but here's the, the finished image, which you could being that this is a square image, you could upload this right to Instagram if you so chose, or Facebook, or wherever else you wanted to show off your, your three-dimensional mug. Um, certainly, you can go further and do additional lighting. Uh, you could add in some depth of field. You could change the materials on the mug, change textures. Um, my second version of this, let me save this real quick, uh, and then I will open up my second version of the mug wherein I did just that so um, I changed the lights around I changed the materials around the mug itself is now kind of a, a darker plastic up top and the bottom half is copper and that was just um, a preset so if you go into uh, the hypershade and with an Arnold material uh, and click on the presets you've got this is a copper preset, and then I just changed the color a little bit because it was a little bit too light before. Um, and so that final product, well, you won't see the final product just yet because it's going to take a second to render. Um, but here's how that looks. So it's, it's certainly a much more dramatic um, look. It's, it's a lot uh, lower key. It's, it's edge lighting, um, very subtle. Even brought down the, the background, set that to, back, to, to black, made the ground... Um, more reflective to get again that kind of dramatic uh, reflection in there but going from uh let's see going from this to this all right that was maybe 15 minutes i added an edge loop extruded it in to get this division and then gave them different materials and moved some lights around it was um, a relatively quick process so you could do a third look you could change maybe the ground to um, well, once we get into image textures properly, you could add, you know, a, a wood texture, make it look like it's maybe sitting on a, on a kitchen counter or a coffee table um, or sitting outside somewhere. 
you know, you could do a, a, a morning sunlight kind of effect. Uh, you know, really, now that the, mu the mug is made at this point, it's just playing around with uh, different effects. So I will let this finish rendering um, and just check in with the, with the final render once it's done. Uh, and that will be it. Thanks for watching. Okay, so here's the finished render on, on the alternate version. So let me, uh, this is like the evil villain's coffee mug, and then this is like the good guy's coffee mug. Um, but two looks, relatively the same model. Um, yeah, that's it.